Happy Mushoku Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek through the Mushoku Tensei Jobless Reincarnation novel series. We are on volume 11, chapter 14. We have two more chapters before we get into volume 12. I apologized last week. <laughs> I, I recorded all of Mushoku Monday last week, and I it went long. And apparently I was having a really bad day because a lot of it got edited out. As people noticed, I had a lot of bloopers. So it turned out to be a very short episode. But either way, my mindset was that chapter 14's huge. And the, the X chapter is pretty tasty. And so I just knew that it wasn't going to fit on that last video, no matter what I did. So apologies for the short video, but as per usual, trying to keep the pace good and not overwork myself and just keep having fun. As much as I want to just get into tw <laughs> to get into that 12, because people, uh, I have read chapter one of volume 12, and I'm mad. I hate the volume already, but dang, the ending just, it had me laughing out loud. <laughs> the ending, despite the fact that I'm really angry, it had me laughing out loud at the very end. So, Refugian. Seriously, dude. Anyways, we're talking about volume 11, though. We are on chapter 14, and hopefully I can get through both of these chapters. If it doesn't run too long, I may jump into volume 12 for this video. We'll see. You'll probably know based on the description or the title, or I might just fake you guys out. I don't know. We'll see. As per usual, I want to thank everybody for dropping by. All those in the chat. Hey, chat. How's it going? Thanks for dropping by. Really appreciate your guys' support. Last week, we got, like, two more members. We had a, a super chat and everything. I, <laughs> I'll keep saying it. It means so much to me. You guys mean so much to me. Even those that cannot support monetarily. You guys mean so much to me. The kind words, sharing it out. Just, just being there to support is it means so much to me it keeps this going and this has been such a rewarding experience for me and just cannot wait to pretty much go through the other half <laughs> we're still got half to go more than half to go so let's get into it let's get into it all this sappy stuff aside chapter 14 the warriors of the desert this chapter was so freaking good <laughs> this is a pure sign of just how much this writer thinks about everything. There's so much stuff that pops up and goes, that makes perfect sense. And I think that's where I'm going to probably have way too much to talk about in this Mishuko Monday, but let's get into it. They set out from Bazaar to Burpan as members of Galban's caravan. Head of the guard team was the warrior Bally Bottom, also known as Hakai. His companions was Carmelita, the Bone Crusher, and Great Blade Taunt, a five-member guard six camels, and one merchant filling the party. Reese considered naming the camels, but they may have to eat them later. <laughs> yes, if they get lost or something, they're the first to go. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Goblin might be like, eat Carmelita first or something. <laughs> don't take that out of context. They had a meeting before they left to kind of evaluate their formation. Goblin would be in the middle. Bali Bottom would be in the front. Carmelita on the left. Taunt on the right. Ellen Elise and Rudius would be positioned in the back. Of course, keeping the client in the center and allowing them to intercept from any direction. While Rudius felt that Carmelita or Taunt would be better for the rear guard, it made sense to be next to Ellen Lise because, yes, they are used to working together. They traveled east from Bazaar to the major region's road. Rudius had mentioned to Bali Bottom about the whole rumors about the bandits, but they didn't know any safer route. It's kind of like, yeah, they are there because this is the only route to take. <laughs> Bali Bottom isn't dumb, Rudius. <laughs> He's done this a few times. He said that if bandits attack, that's what they were there for. He mentioned the fact that some bandits just wanted something. Like, they just demand a toll or something like that, and they would let them be on their way. Yes, if you think about it, if they killed everybody that came by and stole their goods, eventually you're not going to have anybody to steal from. So I think there's probably some benefit to them saying, okay, just give me all your stuff and be on your way. And yes, if you think about it, this is... This world setting, it's not like if they get injured, they just go to a doctor. So it kind of alleviates any sort of chance of them actually getting injured too. Reese never heard of this before, but with some bandits just making a living, as long as they handed over what they wanted, they shouldn't ask for more. And yes, he sort of kind of indicated that before when they were on the central continent, they would run into bandits and stuff out there. And he said that a lot of them seemed like they were coming from the conflict zone. They were just people looking for food to feed their family. And while he couldn't really say that he'd forgive them for that, <laughs> it still makes sense what they were doing. But honestly, this whole idea of giving up their goods wasn't appealing to Rudius. Giving in to people who threatened travelers instead of working for money. But he wasn't the one paying up, so he could live with it. But Rudius did fear them running into greedier bandits, ones wanting more, like Ellen Elise. While yes, they had saved Galban and the others' lives, 
It wasn't like they were gonna risk their necks for them. They could still hang Rudius and Elise out to dry. I like the sense that Rudius is still kind of keeping them at arm's length. It's like, we're not buddies. So you have to consider that being out in the middle of nowhere and bandits and lives at stakes, somebody's gonna choose to do something that's gonna save their own necks. You look nervous, Rudius, but I wouldn't worry yourself too much. With a magician of your skills on our side, a few bandits shouldn't be an issue. You think so? I do. And if worse comes to worse, I'll use a little charm on them. Uh, what? You want to get carried off to their base, chained up and brutally? Goodness, how extreme. As long as you go willingly, even bandits will be gentle with you. Are you speaking from experience? We all make mistakes in our youth. <laughs> Damn, that's a, that's a chapter right there. <laughs> there. There's a chapter right there. <laughs> I can say so many things and I'm going to keep myself because I don't want to make YouTube mad. <laughs> But it makes sense. Again, another kind of uncomfortable truth and reality of world. Th that's something you technically could do. She didn't seem to concern at all. But those days were long past. She would probably be less eager now with Cliff in her life. Yeah, I can see like before she's like, well, I gotta bang somebody. <laughs> but now it's kind of like one of those aspects that she'd probably be a little more uncomfortable with it because she does technically love Cliff. On their travels, they fought many monsters. We had charging beggar at buffaloes, great tarantulas. There had to be spiders. <laughs> there had to be spiders. I hate spiders. Windmaster eagles who could cast wind magic. Even stuff they encountered before. Apparently, the lizards were gyroraptors. Belly Bottom would spot them ahead of time and avoid serious combat. Yes, he had a demon eye himself, which earned him the name of Hawkeye. His demon eye was the same as Ghislaine's allowing him to see the flow of mana in the world around him, which yes, was a great means to detect enemies. This made things go really well in the fact that he could detect monsters coming up. It was like traveling with Reserve, while not precise with the details. This brings me back a little. Ghislaine used to spot enemies just like that using her eye and her nose. So having someone to detect enemies made combat less risky. Reese was always at ready with stone cannon, but after a while that got tedious, so he just started blasting them into air. <laughs> Bally Bottom spoke up. You're using those spells awfully freely, boy. Aren't you gonna run out of mana? I should be fine. I can keep this going all day long, I think. I see, you're a great sorcerer then. Oh, what does that mean exactly? It's a title given to magicians who have achieved deep mastery in their craft. Uh, well, I wouldn't say I'm a master of anything yet. In any case, it's rare to see a magician willing to use their power so freely. Yes, Rudius thought, yeah, most magicians made it a point not to use more than half of their mana. Since that's all they had, they needed to keep that in order to defend themselves. But Rudius never emptied half his tank as far as he ever knew. Now, this is an interesting thing, because the question mark kind of comes up is, how do they know how much mana? It's not like they have like a meter on the screen that says, oh, that, God, I can't use magic anymore. It's about halfway. It's about 51%. If I go, if I use another spell, it's going to go under. So it kind of makes you wonder if they could sort of sense it. Like they can, they can almost feel like this, I guess like they're filled with something and it's, it's lowering and lowering. It's to a point where it feels like it's halfway. But even here, it's kind of indicating that Rudius doesn't really know. Yes, we've, we've gotten an indication before that he has used all of his mana, especially when he was like really early on volume one, when he was spinning it all and he would just kind of <laughs> he would just collapse. And he talked about the fact that later on when he was crafting the figurines and stuff, he was just crafting stuff just to use his mana up and just crafting them. But it's never sort of indicated that he has like this sense of how much he's using, just a sense of when he's used it all. It was common sense to retain some for emergencies. To desert warriors who knew little about mages, they probably just seen most as slackers. Body Bottom seemed to have enough experience to know why magicians held back. Though it did seem like he lacked some knowledge because he didn't even question Rudius using silent casting. <laughs> it's like, that seems to be the most interesting thing there. No, it's kind of interesting though, because at this point when I was reading through, though I did kind of notice it earlier with the whole comment the guy made, like, Kingdom of Asura, what the hell is that? It sort of gives this feeling like, the Begrit continent is like isolated. Like everybody here just doesn't know anything outside of this world. It really does truly feel like it has its own ecosystem, its own people, and everybody that lives here feels so different from elsewhere. Now, yes, on the demon continent, it felt different. Yes, in the Great Forest, it was a different culture. Yes, going into Milshin, very different culture. Everywhere he's been, it's a different culture in some sense, but it never seems like it ever points out people not knowing about other places. Everybody seems to have some sort of sense of somewhere else. Okay, well, that's that's something that is copyrighted by Milshin or whatever. Oh, those are the people from his, this place. Oh, the demon continent. Yeah, those are the people that can't go into this continent. But it never seems like he goes out of his way to say these people don't know something else. But Begaret continent's different. It seems like on a constant basis, 
they're pointing out these people don't know anything outside of here and they call things differently. He says, are you a great sorcerer? What's a great sorcerer? Is that a saint tier magician? Is that a classification they give here for somebody that reaches what would be a saint tier? Why isn't he thrown off by the fact that Ruius is using silent casting? Does more people in this place that he's experienced use silent casting? Maybe he's used to it. Why wouldn't somebody in a random village not even know about the Kingdom of Asra? It seems odd that everything seems so isolated here. But it sort of gives that indication, the idea that, well, when he asked about the map, the guy's like, why would you need a map? It just feels like I'm here. I exist here. I live here. Why would I care about anywhere else? And you sort of get a sense as you get into the the warriors themselves and how they how they live their lives, how they send them out, fight, eventually retire, come back, raise the next kin. It sort of gives that feeling that these people just, they have no world outside this world. This is their life. Why would they care about the Kingdom of Asra? Why would they care about Renoa? Why would they care about the Magician's Guild? Going on traveling somewhere else is death for a lot of people. It's almost as if because of how their tribe is set up, it's so reliant on you not leaving. You're raised by the village. You go out and fight for the village. You send back children. You retire. You come back and you raise the next kin. It's just what you do. It's very, very cool. I love how different this place is. Still, Body Bottom wanted Rudius to save for an unexpected situation. With five in their group, he could hold back until he's called for. Rudius wasn't really hiding his mana supply being massive, but he didn't want to come out and tell them either. Rudius didn't know his own limits for one thing. Yeah, he could probably say, yeah, no, pfft, I have unlimited. I'm just going to keep casting. Don't worry about it. And then eventually at some point, I don't have it. You're setting expectations. It's kind of similar to claiming that you're this of this rank. Eventually it's going to come back and bite you because people have high expectations for you. He didn't want to get cocky and cause a disaster. At night they took turns guarding Galaban. Even though Rudius created a shelter for everyone, they refused it, claiming it would be hard to notice approaching monsters. Ellen and Elise eased Rudius' mind, claiming that each had their own ways of doing things. On Rudius' shift, he was paired with Carmelita during which time Reese felt staring at nothing silently would be boring. Thankfully, they conversed. Carmelita thanking them for their help and noting how strong he and El Elise was. Carmelita the Bone Crusher was a warrior turning 21 this year. Her weapon was a sword with a wide, thick blade, more than one meter length. Many in this region carried large swords, even Bali Bottom. Reese figured it was because there was so many monsters around here with thick, hard shells, it was probably the only way to combat it. Even though earlier he said everybody carried curved swords, maybe that's the thing here. <laughs> Your woman's sword is too thin though. You can't kill anything with that. You might be surprised actually, it's a magic item. And she knows how to use it. I've seen it cut up griffins. Oh, and just so you know, she's not actually my woman. We're just friends heading to Rapon together. But you sleep with her, yes? When a succubus comes? Uh, no, I, I know some detoxification magic. So I just use that, even though you totally were going to. <laughs> when a succubus comes, the men are aroused. The women sleep with them. It's the way of things around here in the desert. As she explained how succubus and warrior bands worked in this desert, she sounded proud. While present across the continent now, the succubus used to be native in the Southwest region. But during the war 400 years ago, Laplace encouraged them to reproduce. It was all an effort to break the stubborn resistance of the beggar warriors. Succubi were deadly against men, even strong-willed veteran fighters. But succubus could only bring so many victims back to their lair. They chose a few morsels, leaving the others behind. The ones left behind fought each other to death. Once poisoned by the pheromones, all the men were your enemy. It was like a charm status. To cure this, you had to cast intermediate tier detoxification, or let them sleep with women. 400 years ago, basically no one on the continent knew how to use detoxification magic. So many young men who were virgins ended up losing their lives. Over time, the warriors of the Begrit continent adapted to these circumstances. Every band began to travel with a number of women. First of them were slaves and demon prisoners. There it is right there. <laughs> I've been waiting for that. <laughs> I've been waiting for that. Sorry, random side tangent here. I remember, um, I, I think I mentioned the last Mystical Mondays, it, it felt like they weren't really pointing out any non-humans on the bigger continent. Despite the fact that I had some theory that there was some sort of connection between the two continents with this one and the demon continent. But here, it finally mentions demon prisoners. And then later on, they'll actually mention they run into a beast folk. So there are technically demons here. Now, granted, beast folk are kind of categorized differently. He kind of mentions that when he first gets to the the forest, the fact that beast folk are kind of different, mainly due to circumstance of history. But yes, the first of these people to sleep with the men was demon prisoners and slaves. But quickly, they realized that non-combatants were only slowing them down. 
either by a low stamina or the need of protection. The warriors thought it over and found a solution in training women to be fighters. Thus the women warriors of the Vagrant continent came to be. At present, every group of fighters or guards had at least a few women. When a group encountered a succubus, the women were responsible for slaying it. And then they would sleep with the men to break the spell. Some groups had more women than men. Facing succubi was easier that way. All in all, the women of this continent did more than their fair share of fighting. Of course, this sometimes resulted in pregnancies, but the women accepted this. They returned home proudly when it happened. The baby would eventually be entrusted to the people of their village and the warrior returned to their duties. At that point, the village would actually raise the child. All were treated equally regardless of their heritage or race. Once they reached adolescence, they underwent a coming of age ceremony and left their village behind. Once a warrior grew too old to fight, they earned the right to return home and devote themselves to raising future generations. Though some choose not to return home, instead spending their whole lives fighting. Bali Bottom was one of them. Carmelita had no objections to her role and even had one child herself. Note that. <laughs> the culture shock was real. Even if Rudius had read of some tribes doing something similar, Rudius had a hard time wrapping his head around this. He couldn't even manage to convince himself that it was sexy. He found himself looking over Carmelita, trying to understand her point of view. I love this because this whole, th like I was mentioning earlier, this whole section is like, Rouge and why you put so much thought into this? Because that's the big question. Like Rudius just ran into like two or three of them, two of them, and he had a hell of a time. Yet you have this entire continent is full of warriors. So the obvious question is gonna come up. How are they handling this? And it goes into that whole aspect of how isolated and different this culture is. And it's so built around this. Laplace flipped this whole place on its head told all these succubus to procreate and spread out and completely destroy the warriors of this continent. But still, yes, it sucks to think about this idea that these women are essentially out there just to kill the succubus, have sex, go back to the village, raise a child, leave, leave the child behind, not able to stay with the child. And Carmelita is proud of it. This is her life. This is her duty for her village. This is my existence and she devotes herself to it. She's not ashamed. She doesn't feel like a tool. This is her pride. This is what she's supposed to do. Still, it shows the uncomfortable side of it through Rudius, pretty much being the reader going, what the heck, this sounds kind of messed up. This feels like these women are just there to bang and kill sick of us. It's the outsider's perspective looking in and going, wow, your culture's kind of messed up. But he's still trying to get her point of view. He's still trying to understand her because obviously from his perspective, looking at her, She's accepted this. This is my life. And she takes pride in it. Everybody in the village takes pride in it. The woman comes in and she's pregnant and they go, okay, come on in. They have the child and everybody raised the child. Every child equally, no matter who they are, no matter who they came from, no matter what their race is, they take care of them. It's super interesting. And it just like, again, another one of those things that just kind of breathes life into this continent. I don't know how, I don't even know how long he's gonna be on this continent. He could just come here, go to the labyrinth, handle things there, and then just go to the teleporter and leave. But yet, again, like I mentioned when I was first talking about the fact that we were finally going on an adventure, is this idea that when Fujin writes adventure, when he's traveling, when Rudius is traveling, it's not just, we went here, we went here, we went here, we fought this, we fought this. It's going, stop and look around. Look around. Look at everything here. Look at how this is a living world. Anyways, hang on. <laughs> I'm grateful to you. I hate mages. If a succubus shows up, go to the other woman. <laughs> Rudy's like, I kind of stung getting shot down in advance, but he could deal with the succubus spell. I like his aspect, like Rudy's has a choice. <laughs> it's like if the succubus gets him, in most cases, they don't really have a choice. All they could think about is I want this. In Rudy's time with Great Blade Taunt, he found him to be the quiet type. The man almost looked similar to Body Bottom if it weren't for the facial hair. Rudius tried to push a conversation to kill time, asking about his name. Apparently, the matriarch, the village elder, chooses their second names, rather than it being a nickname. It was that way for all warriors of the desert when they left. It was often based on strength, sharp eyes, etc., giving anyone an easy way to assess their greatest talent. Again, another thing that's like so weird, but at the same time, it makes perfect sense, and it's, it's logical with their system. If you meet Taunt the Great Blade, you just know dude's got a big blade. <laughs> if you met Hawkeye, you know this dude can see very well. Though Rudius did kind of wonder, that probably meant there's a lot of like 
of the muscles or something like that because there's going to be a lot of tough people. I think he mentioned the idea that it is kind of common to run into other people that just have the same name. This led Rudius to reveal that he was once called Quagmire Rudius, which puzzled the man as Rudius has never used Quagmire here, which yes, it wasn't really effective here because most things could lift off the ground or they were like heavy, slow moving bugs. He also wasn't bothered to stop monsters before targeting them these days now. However, Taunt thought his magic was flashy and wanted to see it at least once. I should have seen the flag here. <laughs> I should have seen the flag here. While it was boring, he said he'd try to use it once when he got a chance. As the party moved further east, the land turned steadily greener. Kinkara lay in this direction and a large jungle beyond that. It was odd for a jungle to be there, but they wouldn't see it. Goblin changed their course at a landmark someone left behind, heading north from there. Three days travel passed and they met the region road. It was more like a natural product of travel than a paved, maintained road, but it was firm and reliable under his feet. Once there, Rius got a sense from Body Bottom that he wanted Galban to consider abandoning his cargo if things got bad, but he was cut off by Galban, claiming that he was paying them a hefty price. The idea of cargo possibly being worth more than one's life really did puzzle Rudius. Again, this kind of hits on the aspect of just how much somebody puts on their worth. You can probably say it's a pride thing, like, I've made my money, I'm worth so much, I have all this stuff, I'm successful, I'm paying you guys a whole bunch of money, and you just kind of get swept up in the idea of being almost invulnerable based on your wealth. But Body Bottom, and we'll find out the reasons why later on, just wants him to kind of consider this idea of, dude, just don't be afraid of walking away from this stuff. At this point, Body Bottom assigned Quagmire and Dragon Road to stick to Galbon like glue. Like how he starts using their <laughs> like nicknames. Taunt was on the camels. Bonehead would take the rear while he scouted ahead. Apparently the key was to spot ambushes and detour to avoid them completely. With Bali Bottom's expert scouting, they were able to avoid their first ambush. Even without the use of his demon eye, which didn't work well on people, he spotted them the old fashioned way and they took a long detour off the road. However, this was a mistake. <laughs> Maybe because he was spotted while scouting or perhaps only seen a small part of their forces, either way, they came under attack. This is where things get so freaking crazy, <laughs> so freaking crazy right here. Taunt took an arrow straight to the chest. Rudius tried to heal him, but Elnilis pulled him back. And just then an arrow came by and hit a camel. Bali Bottom called for them to run. The threat finally hit Rudius as they ran quickly behind Galban and his camels. Bali Bottom tried to get Galban to release his camels in order to be spared. But again, he was against it. Despite them being greatly outnumbered, as they're running the camel that got shot collapsed with a foaming mouth. This made Rudius realize the arrows were poisoned. It's so crazy, just like, they put so much emphasis on poison in this world. It's like so lethal. A force on horseback was behind them and archers on the hill. Their volley often fell short, but many came dangerously close to hitting them. From what he could see, they numbered 100. The word bandit misled him. This was an army. I did, that's, that's something I never really comprehend too. I'm like, typically when you hear bandits, yeah, there's some cases where you have like, bandit like hideouts and stuff like that but like this massive force of people that are just out in the middle of this desert just attacking anybody. Reese's heart hammered in his chest. The only direction he could see was ahead of them as they were attacked from the rear and the flank. Then Elalace shouted at him. He snapped out of it and the first spells that came to his mind was quagmire and deep mist. The quagmire was created just deep enough that the horses would trip on it while the mist was all around them. Despite this the arrows still came close. One making him stumble before Elise caught him. It's all right, Rudius. They've got one brilliant archer, but he won't be hitting us again. Rudius realized she knew the one that killed Taunt and the camel was the same person. It's like really observant. Like how the hell did she catch that? She called for Rudius to run. Nodding shakily, he pushed himself on. Rudius thought he wouldn't be able to target them. He wasn't going to hit me. It just wasn't possible. He was invisible. Damn it. He should have asked Sylphie for a lucky charm. Maybe he should have taken his souvenir from their first night together. Bali Bottom snapped him out of it as he called out for Carmelita. They were catching up, some on horseback. They must have ran around the quagmire. Ruiz then raised up a stone wall behind them as they moved on. They kept running while the arrows seemed to have stopped. Every now and then, he would raise another earth wall. As he ran, Ruiz thought of Taunt. Did they leave him to die? No, he took a poison arrow to the heart. Even with advanced healing magic, it probably would be fatal. Gritting his teeth, he ran as fast as he could. I always hate that sense of like, I could have done something more. I could have done something. He even mentions it like, maybe I, maybe I could have just pulled it out immediately and healed and, and closed it up. 
They kept running for what felt like two hours. Eventually, Bully Bottom gave them the clear. Reeves felt like his daily runs weren't in vain. He could have probably kept going. Even still, <laughs> it keeps hitting him. Like this is something that's just like gonna be constant, like s just rubbing salt in the wound every now and then. Like, oh, here's your daily dose of rubbing salt in that wound. Even still, the warriors of the party barely even had to catch their breath. The battle aura stuff was just unfair. <laughs> in the end, they lost one bodyguard and one camel. Poor Taunt. If only he had been able to yank out the arrow and use some spell. There was a chance that he could have lived, but if Ellen Lace didn't pull him away, he may have been hit by the next arrow. Her experience in battle probably saved his life. Hesitation could have proven fatal. Yeah, that's, and he'll talk about it more here in a minute. Just like, there's a difference in that instinct. That sometimes you just have to know when to pull back. You can't just instinctively go, fix the situation. Because sometimes that's just going to lead to another death or something worse. Well, I don't even know what, more death, I guess. It was worth the death, Andrew. Two deaths, I guess. Rudis then noticed Carmelita glaring at him. He wasn't sure what he did to upset her. She then stomped over to him and grabbed him by the robe. Why didn't you kill them? You could have. You, I saw your magic. What? She expected him to kill the entire group? That was crazy. But he also never really thought about that approach. I like this aspect of like, again, it kind of goes back to, it was sort of what he was talking about with Bali Bottom. This idea of like setting that expectation. Like sometimes there is an aspect of that you can be really incredible and it might set people's expectations for you way too high. Again, this is that case of that. It's like, wait, you're, you're incredible. You, you're like this crazy magician. You could have just blasted everything. It's interesting that he even still goes, wait, yeah, I, I didn't think about that. Stop it, bonehead. You saw it too, didn't you? He made the horses sink into the ground. He made them run into the walls. He made everything foggy. You're not thinking this through, damn it. Use your brain for once. Shut up. If he had used his magic, he could have avenged Taunt. There were too many of them, kid. That was Haramoth's band out there. I'm sure of it. There was more of them behind those hills. But, ah. Uh. Ellen Lace then pushed herself between them, pressing her buckler against Carmelita. <laughs> oh, this is such a good scene. <sighs> this is such a good scene, my gosh, dude. When I read this, I was like, holy crap. I I love this girl so much. <laughs> I love this girl so much. She had her hand on her rapier. Do you object to the way that we handled that? What? Reyes acted appropriately, given the situation. We were hugely outnumbered and facing a force of unknown strength. Worse, they were shooting poisoned arrows at us. He stopped their cavalry with his quagmire, blinded their archers with his mist, and brought us the time to escape with his walls. He's the only reason we're alive. We lost one man and a single camel, but we got away. Would you have preferred to stand and fight? We would have died like fools, and they would have taken everything. Note. She's not speaking fighting gun tongue. <laughs> She's not speaking their language. And Elise's words meant nothing to Carmelita. She was speaking in human tongue, but her frosty tone made her meanings clear enough. It was rare to see Elise speak so aggressively to anyone, especially an ally. She was right though. There was 50 at a glance, but there was probably a hundred or more of them. Could Rudius have killed a force that size? It was hard to say. Again, I want to stop here and acknowledge this. I love that she just bumps her boy, grabs her rapier, just chews her out. But that's enough. Like, again, she doesn't know what she's saying, but you know, just based on, I mean, that's just like anybody. I mean, if, if somebody that does it speaks in a language that you don't understand just comes to you and just bumps into you and just based on their tone alone, you're going to know what they're saying pretty much without them you knowing what they're saying. She knows Annalise is objecting to her confronting him. The reason why Ellen Lace is even there is because she knows that this girl is angry with how Reyes handled this. But again, it's interesting because Carmelita's angry, again, because she has this, there's, I, I see two things in Carmelita. Obviously we find out that this is, this is personal for her, but there is an aspect of what she's saying here. She's telling Bobby Bottom, you've seen it too. He did all this crazy stuff. Again, the expectations high. She thinks in that moment when this person dies, that's important to her, and then sees Rudius doing some crazy stuff, she's like, he can kill them all. This guy's gonna take them all out, probably. I'm running for right now, we gotta flee, but this guy's gonna take them out, right? But he doesn't. She had that expectation set high. But no, it keeps getting better with Ellen, at least it just keeps getting better. But this is interesting though, because Rudius realized, yeah, 
He could have casted a wide range spell after the quagmire to decimate the archers. They could have knocked all the riders off of their horses with a blade of wind. He could have roasted them with fire. It was theoretically possible. He wasn't confident he could pull it off though. They could have experience in fighting mages. One archer could survive. One rider could have passed the quagmire. If it turned to melee, he couldn't use magic without killing an ally. And Elise was aware of this. That's why she was taking his side firmly. And just to remind you, we are bodyguards, not mercenary soldiers. We didn't sign up to fight an entire army on our own. Is there a reason you're still glaring at me? Do you want to fight? Is that it? What a willful child. I'll indulge you if you insist. I love this girl so much. <laughs> Freaking love. I need I need an Ellen Elise up here. We we need to put an Ellen Elise right here. I never thought. I mean, I there is a side of me that does think this in a lot of cases. There's a there's a lot of care. It's it's hard not to find a character in this series that you don't just end up falling in love with. Yes, there's some characters like Darius. I don't know. Maybe Refugion at some point is gonna make me like Darius. Don't do it. But I have an expectation anymore that every character I run into is going to, they're either going to hit me at some point, I'm going to fully understand them, I'm going to i am gonna see them through and through, or I'm just going to absolutely fall in love with them. Ellen Lace was a character that, yes, there was, at a, there was a time where I was like, this is the thirsty girl, I'm just not going to care for her. God damn, just it keeps every chapter with Ellen Lace and it just makes me love her more and more. Losing her patience, Ellen Lace drew her raper. Carmelita hurried to reach her broadsword before Bali Bottom stepped between them. Cut it out, both of you. Look, it's a damn shame that we lost Taunt, but Quagmire made the right choice. The only one who wanted to fight was you, Bonehead. You really are a moron sometimes, you know that? Shut up. Carmelita then backed down and crouched near the camels, burying her face in her knees. Bali Bottom apologized before explaining that she had a kid with Taunt. He explained that she was just lashing out. She just kind of explains that she's this is that interesting aspect, and I think it sort of gets into it later. I'm not sure. I forget. There is an aspect here that despite the fact that she is proud, this is the thing that she does. There is a cultural aspect of this area that, again, every female warrior, they'll fight the succubus, they'll service the men, and if they get pregnant, they'll bring them back to the village, they'll leave the child behind, and go back to service. They're proud of it. But there's an indication that there's no connection here. Like, when you sleep with a man, it's not as if you're making some sort of love confession. She fell in love with Taunt, obviously. She had feelings for Taunt, because Taunt gave her a child. Despite the fact they're not supposed to be connected, they're connected. So it's an aspect that this is their system, but there's still flaws in it. Love still breaks it in some way. Ruse figured that female warriors didn't get emotionally attached to any one specific man. That clearly wasn't the case. Maybe it was different if they had a baby with somebody. Ellen Lace then sheathed her rapier and faced Rudius. There's no reason for you to feel down about this, Rudius. There isn't. There's some adventurers out there that make it a point to never kill another human being. Not many of them, granted, but they do exist. And you're going to become a father soon. I can understand why you hesitate to take so many lives. This is the interesting part. <laughs> this is gonna take some talking right here. Her attempts to comfort him was a little off the mark. She didn't know what Bali Bottom just said. To be honest, Rudius didn't hesitate at all. The thought of killing those men didn't even enter his mind, despite the mortal danger that they were facing. Some of the riders may have died riding head first into those walls. He didn't even have guilt about that, but the idea of using magic to murder someone directly did make him queasy. It was kind of pathetic, honestly. It's so interesting that I get so many mixed messages from this whole segment, and there's an obvious flow that he's going through here. It's obvious, it starts off with this aspect of, okay, Ellen Lace is saying this, but I didn't hesitate. Like, nothing, she believes that I'm this person that is an adventurer that doesn't want to kill anybody, which is a kind gesture. She's making this kind gesture, assuming that Rudius just didn't want to hurt anybody. But that didn't cross his mind. He's saying that, no, that didn't, that didn't cross my mind. Despite the fact that we were in, like, mortal danger here, it was just that aspect of, like, it's fight or flight. It's just flight. <laughs> just run. Run. Holy crap. Holy crap. Run. Run. Okay, something behind me. Put something up. Put something up. No, he never thought about put up wall. Could it kill somebody? No, that didn't, that didn't cross his mind. He thinks about that. Well, yeah, technically they, they could have hit. They were in mist. Riding full speed on horseback. And this, <laughs> this wall appears. Smash. They, there are probably a few people that died. Not that he feels bad for that. But he still thinks 
yeah, the the idea of using my magic to kill somebody directly, murder somebody, that makes me queasy. It was kind of pathetic. No, that's not pathetic. I mean, y yeah, I, I guess in the mindset of, okay, I shouldn't feel bad about that because the dudes were coming after us to kill us. So he thinks it's pathetic to even consider, yeah, that kind of sucks the idea of killing them. But that's, again, a good thing. <laughs> It, it's a, it's a it's a sign that you do care for human life that you don't want to kill somebody but at the same time it's justified it's a mixed bag of thought process here and i didn't really think about killing them it's not that i cared that they died but at the same time yeah i would that that kind of makes me feel sick that i might kill somebody still he thanked her she was trying to cheer him up and here's where it gets even cooler <laughs> freaking love Ellis. <laughs> Thinking back on it, she had been running at his side the entire retreat. She didn't leave him behind. She could have ran ahead. She could have left him behind. Every time he lost his balance, she was there to brace him. It felt like she positioned herself to shield him from straight arrows too. So she's running alongside him, blocking all the arrows and just kind of bracing him. Keep running, keep running, keep running. He had a feeling that she considered herself his bodyguard more than anything else. More than... All the rest of them, yes, even Galban. <laughs> no, she's here protecting him. No need to thank me, dear. She patted him on the shoulder. I'll always look out for my grandson. <laughs> Her grandson, huh? Sylphie was carrying Elise's great-grandchild. He was certain that she wanted the arrival to be a happy occasion. And I think that she really does care for Rudius. Or maybe she didn't want to have to explain his death. Either way, they would have to make it back safe. Again, he thanked her putting more feeling into the words. She replied by patting him on the shoulders. I just, I absolutely love these two. I love Ellen Lee's like mostly, but yes, I love these two so much. Their party, despite the awkward atmosphere, continued onward. Bali Bottom was surprisingly calm and collect, despite losing another man. He focused on reforming their formation, never speaking Tort's name again. He was the same, focused and professional bodyguard he always was. While cold, it was probably how this line of work went. Death was a constant companion to them. A common attitude on the demon continent as well. It was always a mindset that Rudius couldn't understand. Again, it's a different way of life. It's kind of that interesting aspect of it. You even see it in even our world these days. I mean, you, you see it a lot if you look into history. There's a lot of ways that people chose to live that just seems so weird now. Especially from a first world country kind of mentality of like, our only concern is what thing is trending on Twitter today. Whereas for people in the history or people in this world, their life is getting money to send back to their families, not dying that day. And if your friend dies, that was their turn on the next one. It's a mindset that Rudius can't understand because he's from a mindset of typically safe environments. Yes, he had to go through the demon continent at some point, but most of his life was safe. In a sense. Yes, in his previous life it was miserable for him, but he was safe. He wasn't having to travel out with a pack of people and wondering which one of us is going to die today. This is their life. A few uneventful days later, they reached the oasis that marked their midway point. Much like Bazaar, it was a marketplace that surrounded a small lake. While resting, Galban and Balibadam discussed replacing their fallen. It seemed Galban had more trust in the skill of Rudius and Elanis, opting to wait until they reached Rapan. But he admitted he was lucky to get away with only losing one, facing a force that large. So at least Galban understands. Like, again, it gives that sense that Galban is like super selfish. He is, he is selfish. <laughs> but he, even despite the fact that he's like, no, I'm not going to discard these camels. They're my life. They're everything to me. He still understands what they went through. He still can at least recognize that was a really close call. After Reese mentioned how casual the two of them were with each other, Galban mentioned that they had worked together since the days that he was a fledgling merchant. Reese figured that Bali Bottom was closer to Galban than Taunt, his fellow warrior. Serving as head bodyguard for so long, he possibly seen his men and women as disposable or interchangeable, given how regularly they came and went. I think that's pretty harsh words to use, Reese. I don't think it's that much. But again, I think it's more of an aspect of desensitizing. Like, you've you've seen it so much, it's just a regular occurrence. After resting and replenishing, they headed north. Carmelita didn't pick any fights with him, but they didn't talk at Nightwatch. 
they were going to go their separate ways when they reached Rapan, but still he had to empathize with what she was going through. You couldn't imagine what it felt like to lose the father of your child so suddenly. It would hurt to lose Sylphie. The despair would be immense. And I guess I'm going to regret this, aren't I? Assuming the man god was being straight with him, this voyage was going to cost him one way or another. The man god first told him that when he met El Elise at the age of 15. Using teleportation meant that he wasn't going to get to Rapan that much later than if he immediately left after meeting El Elise. Interesting point. He assumed that the danger that awaited him there in Rapan hadn't changed in that time. If that was true, it probably meant no harm would come to those that he left behind in Ronoa. After all, if he left a Begret right away, he would never have met Sylphie or gotten to know the others. He'd have no regrets from a disaster taking place there. That's at least where he can take some sort of solace in knowing. Again, he's sort of connecting the timelines together, but the regrets may be different now. Things might go smoothly on his end, but poorly back home. Something might happen to Sylphie or the baby. He had to stop speculating on this, or it would drive him insane thinking of all the things that might go wrong. A guy like himself was going to make mistakes, no matter how hard he tried. He gets stuck, <laughs> he gets stuck in this so often. Just anything the man god tells him, he just keeps running it through his head. What if you meant this? What if you meant this? What if you meant this? Well, I shouldn't stop, I, sh I need to stop thinking about that. What if you meant this? What if you meant this? N no, okay, I gotta, I gotta stop thinking about this. He can't help himself but run through the possibilities, even though it never helps him in the end. It's doubt. Doubt's always present in your mind. I find myself doing that a lot, like where you just, you just, you want to sleep and you just keep thinking about things that what can go wrong? How are things going? What did I do? Did I forget to do this thing? It, it sucks. It's the worst when you're trying to sleep. This was the first time that he'd gone directly against the man god's advice. Did that mean that his choice was going to end in disaster no matter what? Nah, he wasn't buying it. He knew that there was danger ahead. So it was possible to avoid it. To avoid someone he cared about ending up like Taunt, he had to stay sharp. There is an aspect of wondering, is it? I think that's the aspect that I don't think I've ever really talked about on here, but there is an element of what is these prophecies or whatever that the man god gives him. And in some cases, is it predestination or is it just a set of things that can happen? So in the end, like he's thinking about here, if I know dangers ahead of me, I just have to be really sharp and I can probably avoid it. But is it you thinking that you have to be sharp about it going to cause the disaster? Is it, again, predestination? While Rudius wanted to say that he'd protect his family from someone wanting to harm them, he wasn't sure if he was capable of murder. He just have to keep his family safe. That, at least, he could promise himself. I think that's, again, kind of connecting to the earlier comment about the fact that he wasn't really trying to do that, but now that he thinks about it, it kind of makes him queasy. This idea that, you know, I'm not sure that I can really stone cannon somebody if I'm going to be able to pull that off, if I can really let it go into somebody. He's even had that with a succubus. A succubus, he still was like, he kind of pulled back a little bit. But there is an element of, yeah, if somebody is dangering your family, what are you going to do? I think it kind of comes down to the conclusion of, well, I can at least keep them safe. Like, I might not be able to kill somebody, but I can at least shield somebody, protect somebody, bring them out of that harm's way. He sort of did it when he first ran into Aisha. He didn't kill all the soldiers. He just grabbed Aisha and left. Two weeks later, they reached the labyrinth city of Rapan. Now, it was time to get started. And that is chapter 14. Holy crap, what a long chapter. Such a long chapter. I try to condense it as much as possible, but there's so much in there. And I think it all kind of sets up for... I freaking love Elise. I'm just going to keep gushing about Elise. Shut up, Andrew. Let's get into the extra chapter, because I'm, I'm thinking the extra chapter is going to be long, too. <laughs> extra chapter, Norn and the Mills Church. Norn was feeling uneasy, to put it lightly. A month had passed since Rudius had left. While the city of Soraya was peaceful, it was hard to believe that most of her family was in danger somewhere else. It's like she's standing in this city, and it's super quiet. Nothing bad's going on, and all she can think about is, but over here, everybody's in danger. It's hard for her to really connect that. She wondered what Rudius was going through right now. Just got attacked by a bunch. I don't know how, I don't know the timelines if it matches up perfectly. <laughs> was it her pestering that had driven him out there to face dangers he was unprepared for? If he dies, Sylphie would be devastated. Norm wasn't as sharp as Aisha, but even she knew Sylphie's brave smile hid her real feelings. Yes, she's fits. <laughs> she fits as good hiding stuff. Deep down, Sylphie was suffering even now. 
even with how talented Rudius was, he could die. And Norn had put him up to it. I didn't actually think this was going to become a thing, but this sucks. <laughs> with everything that we've kind of experienced with Norn this volume, it's like, here's another one. And another one. Now we pretty much have Norn literally feeling like she sent Rudius off to his death. It's her fault if something happens now. If she hadn't pestered him, if she wasn't selfish, he would be with Sylphie right now. It was a painful thought. Anxiety and regret were enough to crush her. As she sighed out the window of her dorm room, something that she does regularly these days, she remembered that it was the day that she typically would visit the Grey Rat household that she agreed to. Reluctantly, she headed off towards the house. It's kind of like, <laughs> I read this part and I'm like, wait, aren't you visiting on a daily basis? Helping take care of Sylphie? But I guess she's on standby. <laughs> The resentment and mistrust that she felt towards Rudius has mostly gone. She didn't hate him the way that she did once before, but that part was what made it so scary. If they got a letter of his death, she didn't know if she could bear it. She's now considering, I don't hate him anymore, and that kind of sucks because now if I see a letter that he's dead, I don't think I can take it. She's going to be broken from it. She wasn't sure how she would apologize to Sylphie. There was also Aisha too, but she didn't care so much... <laughs> But she didn't care about her quite as much. She's like, yeah, I might have to tell Elijah too, but I don't really care about that. I don't think, and this is that mindset of a child, that she would think that Sylphie would blame her. Like, Sylphie, I just have to tell you, it was my fault. I sent him, I pushed him to go. Sylphie would be like, no, Rudius chose to go. He's his own person. There's nothing that you can say that's going to make him do something that he doesn't want to do. Now, granted, yes, we know that she did push, and that was a push he needed. But he's not charging into the Beggar Continent going, Gosh darn it, Norn told me to come here, and I really don't want to be here. Norn's mind was going in circles. Something that she had a bad habit of doing. Once she started worrying, it was hard to stop. At some point, she stopped. She spotted something in the corner of her eye. Something that she's seen often in Millis. A Millis church. Come to think of it, she hadn't said her prayers lately. Being a member of the Millis faith, she was brought to church on a regular basis by her mother's family. She learned the basics, not something that she consciously chose herself, but she didn't feel like the family forced her into it either. She acknowledging that she sort of went into this whole thing, it wasn't like her family <laughs> drove it in her head that like, you have to have the Millis faith. It was important to learn the church's teachings in Millis. Everyone expected you to know and obey them. Still, she wasn't exactly a passionate believer. After leaving Millis, she didn't even feel the need to wander around looking for churches to say prayers in. However, today, she found herself turning down that street. Inside the church, it was quiet and it had a hint of warmth. It was something familiar to her. The size was different, but the orderly benches and the shrine was the same. Feeling a bit nostalgic, she knelt in front of the holy symbol of Millis, joining her hands together. Great Saint Millis, hear my prayer. Please. Bring my brother home safely, and my father, and my mother, and Melilia too. I'm surprised she didn't say, and the maid too. <laughs> and the maid too. She can come home too. She's changed a lot. She didn't say the maid. She's changed a lot. She felt she might be asking too much by naming everyone individually like that. St. Millis never interceded on behalf of the greedy. It was important to keep wishes modest. Yet, she only chose to rephrase it. Please, help everyone make it back safely. If Millis granted her plea, she'd finally have her family back together for the first time in so many years. That was what she wanted more than anything. Or rather, that's the only thing she wanted. I, it's so funny because, like, we've seen so many characters go through some really crappy things because of the displacement. Edis has lost everyone. Except for Ghislaine. Everyone. And her, and her butler. Everyone. Sylphie has lost everyone. Except for Rudius. Everyone. Lilia and Aisha went through hell. Paul is going through so much hell. Rudius is learning that he's going through hell. It's an interesting point, by the way. Rudius is learning that he has gone through hell. He's learning family and learning what he has lost. Norn, I feel 
more crushed by because she experienced it so young and yet she has such a different mindset as Aisha. Yes, they're both the same age, but Aisha still had her mother with her the whole time. She didn't really lose too much. Norn has lost so much and she just wants, she even through all the years, she still just wants this back. Give me this back, please. I just want to be back in Buena Village with my family like we were. This whole time is watching hell destroy my father and mom's gone. Give this back to me. I just, this is all I want. I don't need millions. I don't need riches. I don't need all this other stuff. I don't need video games. I don't need money. I don't need wealth. I don't need clothes. I just want my family back together. It's all she ever wanted. That's the only thing she wanted. This girl just keeps breaking my heart. Norn's in the chat. Following her prayers, she felt a bit better. Maybe it was because the atmosphere of the church or putting her thoughts into words. She felt she could come again. Following her exercises and classes, she would visit the church. However, one day, something gave way inside of her. During her prayers, she began to cry. She knew coming here was only consoling herself. Praying made her feel like she was doing something, but she wasn't really. There wasn't anything she could do, as it has always been. She was powerless. And that hurts. And because that is essentially the aspect of religion itself. Religion is only what you believe it is. If you are a believer in a religion, your firm belief is that through your prayers, something will happen. Now, granted, my concept of religion that I have personally is different than her concept and the concept of the Millis Church. Like she says earlier, this idea of if I ask too much, St. Millis will see that it's greedy and St. Millis never intercedes on those that are greedy. Whereas my concept of religion doesn't necessarily have that aspect to it. But the idea still is the same right here that if you don't believe it's going to happen and you don't have a firm belief in that religious figure, you're not doing anything. She doesn't fully believe in St. Millis. So thus, when she prays, it's only to console herself because she doesn't really technically believe St. Millis will do anything. But even still, I do think there's a concept that you can have that belief that something can intercede because in this mindset, she's giving it to St. Millis, and Millis can choose to intercede or not. But in her coming there every day, she's believing that she's only there because she can't do anything else, and this will make her believe that she's doing something. And that hurts. She covered her face, feeling pathetic and frustrated. Why are you crying? She was startled. The priest wasn't usually around at this hour, so she usually had the place to herself. A young man emerged from the confession booth. Same age as Brutius, and seemingly headstrong type. <laughs> Just by a look. Oh, that dude's full of himself. <laughs> Who are you? He frowned irritably. What? You don't recognize me? I'm Cliff Grimoire. I'm a novice at this church. Just started here this year. He was a little full of himself for a mere novice, but that caused her memory to jog. He was a friend of her brother's, a somewhat notorious student at the university. She also seen him helping this church during mass. She wiped away her tears and bowed slightly. Cliff snorted and strode closer. <laughs> He's so weird. He's so weird. Something bothering you then? Go ahead. Tell me about it. Huh? If something is making you miserable for no good reason, I'll deal with it for you. You have my word. She was confused by the offer. While yes, a friend of Rudius, she was speaking to him for the first time. These people are going to take care of Rudius' family. Uh, but I think you may be aware... But the woman Rudius is traveling with is my wife. I'm worried about her, of course, but I have faith in Rudius' skills. I'm confident that he will keep her safe. So for my part, I have an obligation to protect his family here in Shariah. If he risks his life for Lise, I'll do the same for you and your sister. That made more sense. She knew Ellen Lay's party with her father, but not that she was married. It figured, though, because she was beautiful. Apparently, Cliff was spending his afternoon studying inside of the confession booth, awaiting rare visitors. But he revealed himself when he seen that she was crying. He even noticed that she came there daily to pray. At this point, Cliff urged her to trust him, that he would take care of everything. He was confident, 
thumping his hand to his chest, even offering her to use the confession booth if it was awkward. Norm was wary of the offer, but then she remembered her brother visiting that day at the dorms. The anxious look on Ruiz's face. Maybe Cliff, with all of his big talk, was feeling the same thing as her. Cliff probably wanted to go to the Begarit continent just like Norn. So, Norn opened up, explaining how Rudius didn't want to go, but she pushed him and changed his mind. How he could die, Sylphie would be devastated. If he died, it would be her fault. It was an act of desperation in wanting to help her father, pushing Rudius to save him. But at the same time, it hadn't occurred to her that Rudius might not come home. She never even thought about Rudius' safety. She just wanted to save father. She also mentioned the fact that she was powerless and could only pray to comfort herself. <laughs> Cliff. <laughs> Cliff. Cliff replied with a dismissive snort. What? Is that all? What do you mean, is that all? She expected him to understand. So this felt like a kind of betrayal. <laughs> Despite her sulky glare, he snorted again. Listen, I'm not trying to brag, but I hail from Millis. That's where I come from too. Let me finish, please. I am the grandson of the Millis Pope. I was mixed up in a power struggle there. So my grandfather shipped me off to study here. In other words, I can't just go back home anytime soon. No, no matter how much I want to help my family, I can't do a thing for them. I'm a lot like you, in other words. So, what do you think I should do about that? Why are you asking me? I don't know. She didn't have an answer. That's why she was crying. That's why she turned to him for advice. I see. Fortunately, I'm something of a genius. <laughs> you want to punch him, but you want to hug him too. You want to punch him, but you want to hug him too. I'm something of a genius, so I know the answer. Would you like to hear it? Yeah, please. His tone was getting on her nerves, but she wanted to hear what he had to say. <laughs> She's conflicted. Like, I, again, I want to punch him right now. <laughs> Very well. First of all, think about the reason why I'm in this city. I was sent here because of the power struggle back home. Why? Because I'm too weak to defend myself. I'm young, inexperienced, and have no real authority. It would have been very simple for them to abduct me and use me as a hostage. My grandfather is a sharp, ruthless man, but I'm a valuable part of his plans for the future. If his enemies kidnap me, he would be forced to listen to their demands. All this made sense to Norn. It was similar to why she had been left behind. If she was powerful as Rudius, she would have gone with him or gone on her own. Basically, if I want to avoid becoming a hostage, I need the strength to defend myself from violence. Strength? What do you mean? I'm not talking about physical power. In my case, I'm focusing on studying, gathering as much information as I can, and learning new magic. And making magical ponsu. Oh, and making friends counts too. Especially if they have unusual skills or might rise to powerful positions. When you've got strong allies on your side, it's harder for your enemies to hurt you. The last part was something Cliff realized fairly recently after falling in love with Elise and making friends with Rudius. But there weren't many that could tolerate his attitude. <laughs> Which we're getting a nice healthy dose of right now. So yes, he hasn't really expanded his social circles very much yet. 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 So you're training yourself basically for what? If I'm suddenly called back to Millis one day, I want to bring new skills, new magic, and new connections with me. I'll make use of them to help my grandfather and quickly secure myself a lofty position in the hierarchy of the church. I feel like with everything with him and Elise and technically with the church itself and all the stuff that's going on in there, I think that'd be a very interesting thing if when it happens. It really feels like with what Cliff has kind of learned through his travels and everything and experiences, he probably wouldn't change some things. It was all a fantasy at this point, but Cliff believed it earnestly. As long as he trusted his abilities and worked to develop them, he was sure this future would come to pass. He's sure there'll be a point which he'll go back and he's going to have all this stuff to go to grandfather and say, I've been working. Here's what I have. What can I do to help? It's so interesting because we don't really get too much of a sense of Cliff and his relationship with his grandfather. Yes, we get the backstory. We get to find out that he is truly the grandson of the Pope, not necessarily just somebody that he picked up. But it's just kind of like, it focuses so much on his experience with Edis 
And then it kind of just cuts away. It says that things are happening. He gets chipped off. Now we're really getting a sense of that he really does trust his grandfather. His grandfather's working for his best interest. And that he wants to do something to help him at some point. That's never going to happen though. Norn muttered this looking to the ground. No one would call her to beggar it anytime soon. Even if they did, she wouldn't be of any use. If father and brother couldn't deal with the situation, she wouldn't be able to help. I love this. <laughs> Laura keeps getting better. I love this chapter. Oh, but it will. Not tomorrow and not the day after tomorrow. But someday there will come a day when our strength is put to the test. Perhaps it will be a year from now. Perhaps five, even ten. Listen, Norn, there isn't much that we can do. Now that we've been left behind, if we tried to go help, we would only get in the way. I know that. Good. This is a very reason why we need to use this time effectively. We need to focus on the few things that we can do. And we need to grow stronger. This happens to be the teaching of the Millis Church, by the way. This is where it gets so good. So good. Cliff pulled a copy of the Holy Scriptures from his robe and recited the passage from memory. It's like he has to pull it out. He's like, I'm not even going to read it. He's just like, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to hold it. It's technically, in a lot of cases, they'll do that. But yeah, anyways. Adamos chapter 12, verse 31. In these times of suffering, the righteous one endured. In these days of hardship, he cultivated his strength. When the weak of heart asked him why, the righteous one told them that the day would surely come for him to strike with all his might. And when the wicked king and demons bore down on this great host, the righteous one swung down his holy sword upon them. The blade divided the mountains, the forests, the seas, and it cleft the wicked king of demons in twain. Norma remembered this first well. It was the one that she memorized in her old church. The story of St. Millis bringing down his sword on the demon army. The power of the weapon that was so great it reached from Milshin to the Blue Worm Mountain, and then the great forest, and then across the ocean. It struck the demon king at the spot where the wind port stood now, killing him instantly. The place where Millis launched his attack was now known as the Holy Sword Road. She learned about that when Rudius was traveling. The stupendous might of St. Millis is what most people remember about this passage, of course, but its true importance lies at the beginning. Even Millis himself was not omnipotent. He needed to bide his time, gather his strength, before he could bring down the Holy Sword on his enemy. If you look at history books, You'll read that Mill's army fought in great battles against the demons on the northern coast during this time. The human army's commander was Peter Doloy, said to be St. Millis's closest friend, and he died in that fight. Pained as he was by this loss, Millis kept his focus on the future. You mean he abandoned his friend? He left him to die? No. Millis trusted his friend, and his friend trusted him. It was for that very reason that Peter fought to the death to slow the demon's advance rather than retreating in defeat. And thanks to that sacrifice, their shared dream of victory and peace was realized. With this emphatic lecture at an end, Cliff stared down at Nora's eyes. Now tell me, what is your dream? I just want my family to be reunited. I want us to be happy again. Then do what you can do to realize that goal. Study hard to learn your magic. It will be a great relief to your brother Rudius and your father, wherever they might be. What am I supposed to do after that? After I've learned what I can, I mean. He nodded, looking to the shrine, pausing for a moment, and then answering. In the end, you pray. St. Millis is always watching over us. Honestly, if Cliff was talking to Rudius, he would have rolled his eyes at this. But Norn wasn't like her brother. She was moved by these words. For the first time, she felt that things that she had learned in church truly were meaningful. Her teachers and Millis told her to end each day with prayer. It seemed a bit arbitrary at the time. Why not the beginning of the day? Now she understood. There had to be a reason for it after all. I think I understand. I'll focus on what I can do now. I'm very glad to hear that. If you run into any trouble and need help with your studies, feel free to seek me out. I'm usually here at this time of the day, but you can also find me at my lab on the campus. All right. Lauren left the church that evening in a newly buoyant frame of mind. She had a goal now. She would follow the teachings of her faith and grow stronger in her brother's absence. It wasn't much, but it was a start. I know I just kind of burned through all that, but damn, it's so good. It's so good. Okay, there's multiple things to talk about here. One, Cliff's a good boy. <laughs> Cliff is a good boy. He's taking care of the girls while Reese is gone. But I love this aspect so much because 
again, going back to my experience with religion and faith and scriptures and stuff like that, it's really, truly, honestly, one of those things where despite someone not technically having a religion or something, something they believe in, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of scriptures that has knowledge. It's, it's this the same as any other historical document or written work or something like that. There's always kind of truths within things. And I really love how Cliff kind of puts it in perspective, this idea that with the Millis faith, with this certain scripture, it's similar to many other scriptures like that where you often get kind of lost in this one section of it. Like he says, when people read that or when people look at the history and stuff like that, all they focus on is the grandeur, the, the amazing feat of Millis bringing down that sword because that's exactly what she thought of. When he read that scripture, what happens? In her mind, Norn is thinking, oh yeah, I remember that was the point when she brought the sword down, it blew up everything, and it made this big, long cut in the ground, it killed the Demon King, and it left the road and everything like that. And he's like, but they miss the first part of that. The first part of that is everything that Norn is struggling with right now. I'm useless. I can't help. What do I do? I sent my brother to his death, possibly. What's going to happen if he doesn't make it back? I was selfish. I just wanted to help dad. I'm useless. I can't do nothing. All I can do is sit here and pray, but that's only helping myself because she doesn't know if Millis is going to do anything or doesn't know if Millis is even true. But he puts everything into perspective from that one scripture. Because again, a lot of the cases with a lot of these scriptures, there is knowledge in there that you can use for yourself to aid you. Even again, if Norn doesn't even truly believe this stuff, this made it make sense to her. She learned that everything that she learned in the church has meaning. This has meaning. And it works for her so well. Because just like Millis, she needs to get stronger. She can't do anything now, just like with the story. His friend's over here dying in battle. Rudius and my family is over here in danger. Millis is over here training. I need to get stronger. I need to train myself. Even if I can't run out there and help them right now, they're buying time. I need to get strong now so that when they do return or they do call for me, I'm ready. But it's nothing. It's not going to solve anything if I just sit here and wonder if I did something wrong. Get stronger. Learn. Teach yourself things. Get knowledge. Find something that you can excel in to either be useful for them at some point or just to show that you have achieved something when they return. It's all she needed. She needed a purpose, a statement that she can connect with. Cliff even gave his own personal account and it didn't work for her. Just, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, we're kind of the same, but what does it matter? Like, what, what's going to happen? Well, I'm eventually going to get called. Well, I won't get called. Okay, let me give you another example. He just keeps hitting her with examples to kind of show her this is something you need to focus on rather than focus on what you can't do. That's Norn's problem. She's so focused on what she can't do that she never moves. So the question mark is, what is she going to do to grow stronger? <laughs> I'm really curious is what, what Norn's path would actually be to getting stronger. Technically, all of you kind of shown so far is that the one thing that was sort of unique, that's sort of cool for her is that she can write well. But I think it's probably more than that. And again, my original assumption was that she was going to follow in the path of Zenith. There was a point where they did sort of nudge that direction, the idea of becoming a healer like Zenith. But it didn't seem like she really kind of acknowledged it. But it was kind of a nasty point for her that she wouldn't want to speak up. It was Rudius, and she didn't want to talk to him. But I think it's kind of interesting because she's sort of pointing out the idea of following uh, the teaching of her faith, which just sort of indicates that she's going to follow what this is saying here. Not necessarily she's going to become, I don't know, a, a pastor or a priest or something like that, but specifically to grow stronger. So I'll be interested to see what kind of path she ends up taking. But good on Cliff. Again, I do like the fact that it sort of acknowledges this idea that Norn kind of sees that she's probably trying to hide something. Like he's sort of like me right now, where I'm hurting and I don't want to say anything. The two of them are in the same position. They have somebody out there in danger and they want to help, but they can't. But even still kind of acknowledging that it's almost like he's hiding it. <laughs> it's like he's hiding it very well. And I think Cliff, if anybody knows how to hide that very well, this is a guy that is 
most time pretty outwardly pompous, <laughs> full of himself, haughty or whatever you want to, whatever word you want to use it. And so it's kind of interesting to see that that chemistry between both him and Norn. I think the two of them in this whole experience can really kind of, I guess at least lift each other up, you know, lean on each other through this whole ordeal. And I don't know why I should have seen it coming from a mile away, just based on the fact that the one thing they have is a commonality in the church itself. But again, I wasn't really foreseeing to see this side of Norn where she feels conflicted for sending Rudius. But I almost feel it's a nice cap in to this volume because so much of this volume has honestly been about Norn, surprisingly enough. Which honestly, outside of the fun that has been around Elise and Rudius going on an adventure together, has been the morsel of most of this volume. This volume is literally carried by Norn. <laughs> and now, at the very end, propped up a little bit by Cliff. <laughs> but yeah, super, super good stuff. And since, yeah, it, it, I'm sorry, volume 12 is not gonna happen this, this episode, I'm sorry. Next week, guys, next week we will jump headfirst into volume 12. And like I said before, I've already read chapter one. I'm super angry, but at the same time, the, the end of the, the first, the rest of the jokes aside, there's a reason why I'm angry about chapter one. And most people probably know what it is, but the rest of that chapter, my gosh, it's just full of stuff. Like it's so full of stuff. Like every line, it's like, I don't know how I'm going to condense any of this stuff. So yeah, there was a few people that kind of already warned me that volume 12 and on is going to be like, a Mushoka Monday for a single chapter going forward. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Based on reading chapter one, I'm already kind of seeing that just because, like I said, it's hard to... I'm, I've am i always been trying to balance what to condense, what to go over, what lines to read. I like to quote actual quotes. I don't like to just condense quotes themselves because I like to read through it again with Mushoka Monday and really deep dive each line by line, even though sometimes I screw up like, but like this one where I read the entire, most of the entire chapter and then talk about it. I like to really hit each point because there's so much in each line sometimes. And I'm feeling with volume 12, I'm getting back that sense of, gosh dang, I'm gonna wanna talk about this. So don't cut that part. Oh, I'm gonna wanna talk about this. Don't cut this part. Don't cut this part. And it's scaring me. <laughs> it's scaring me, but we'll, we'll take it step at a time. As always, take it easy. We'll get through the whole thing. Enjoy the ride as it goes along. If I do a really long episode or don't do a long episode, we'll just see as it goes along. But I am rambling at this point, so I need to stop. But that is it. We have completed volume 11 of Mushoko Tensei Java's Reincarnation. I hope you guys enjoyed the ride so far and you'll continue to join me as we go on 12 and onward. I think I, most people are predicting chapter volume 12 is going to be the final one for season two. So it looks like I possibly can, we'll see, complete uh, season two before season two starts. I don't think I'm going to do all volume 12 in this one month. It ain't going to happen. But I'm definitely not going to get beat by the anime. But as per usual, I greatly appreciate you guys joining me every single week from Mashuka Mondays. All those in the chat, hey chat, once again. Thank you guys so much for dropping by. All those that leave comments at the comment sections open. I appreciate everybody that shares out the channel, tells other people about it, tell your friends about it. All the kind words, all the support you guys give me, it's been so great. I really do appreciate it. It means so much to me. Again, a massive amount of thanks to everybody that supports the channel monetarily through Super Thanks. Tips link down in the description. We have a Patreon link down there if you want to support monthly or just become a member of the channel itself on YouTube itself. And then I'll get you some of Shuko Tensei Jobless Reincarnation emotes. Again, any way that you guys support, it means so much to me. Really do appreciate. Love you guys so much. And until the next Mashuko Mondays, y'all take care. Being out in the middle of nowhere and bandits and lives at stakes Somebody's going to choose to do something that's going to save their own necks. You look Rudy, you look nervous, Rudius, but don't worry. You look Rudy, you look ner you look nervous, Rudius, but don't worry. But you shouldn't worry, but you would but I wouldn't worry yourself too much. With a magician of your skills on our side, a few bandits shouldn't be an issue. I do. And if worse come to worse, I'll use with and to desert warriors who loon though he still seems to s though Rudius admits that he probably still lacks a lot of him Though Rudius, no, though Rudius seem, though.
Though Rudius does still kind of know that he seems like, why isn't he thrown off? Ellen Lace, Rudius is kind of, Ellen Lace, Ellen, Ellen Lace, to cure this, you had to cast Intermediate, and to cure this, you had to cast Intermediate, to cure this, of course, you had to cast Intermediate, but the women accepted this. Returned, returned home proudly. They returned home proudly when it happened. The baby would then, the baby would then, the baby would then eventually, the baby would then eventually be entrusted to the people of the village. The baby would eventually be entrusted to the people of the village, and the warrior would return to their duties. And the warrior would return to her duties. And the warrior would turn. And the warrior would. Yes. And the warrior would. And the warrior would turn. And the warrior would return to their. Du and the warrior would return to their duties. And the warrior would return. And the warrior returned to their duties. The baby would be at that point. The baby would be. Of course, the village would. At that point, the village would actually raise the child. It all were treated. All were treated equally, regardless of their heritage or race. Once they reached adolescence, they underwent an upcoming. At some point, they would reach. At when they re, once they reached adolescence, they underwent a age of. Why? Why am I suddenly just? I can't read. Once they reached. Once they reached. Ad, once they reached adolescence, they underwent a coming of age ceremony and left their village behind. Once a warrior grew too old to fight, they earned the right to return home and devout. They earned the right to return home and devote themselves to raising future generations. They earned the right to return home and devote themselves to raising future generations. Some chose not to return home, spending the rest of their. Though some did choose to not go home. Though some. Though some chose. But even if Rudius had read. Even though Rudius has read. Even though Rudius has read. Even though Rudius. Even if he had read some tribes. Even if Rudius had wrote. Even if Rudius had read the. Even if Rudius had read some. He snapped out of it, and the first spell that came to mind was Quagmire and Deep Man. Even still, the warriors in the party barely even had to catch their breath. Even still, the warriors of the party barely even had to carry. He could have avenged Taunt. He could have avenged. He could have avenged. I would understand why you'd hesitate to make. S I would hunt. I would. I can understand. I can understand you. I can. I can understand why you'd hesitate. After Rudius mentioned how casual Galban and Balban, but still, but he still sympathized. But he still. But he still. But still, he had to simp. But still, he had to empathize. What was he couldn't imagine what it would feel like to lose a father or your child so suddenly. Was it her pestering him that drove him? Was it her pestering him that drove him to go face danger when he was unprepared for? Was it her pestering him that? Was it her pestering that drove? Was it her pestering that had driven him out of to face? Was it her pestering him? Anxiety and regret were enough. Anxiety and anxiety, anxiety, and it cleft the wicked. And it cleft the wicked, and it cleft the wicked, and the and it cleft, and it cleft the wicked demon king, and it cleft, and it cleft the wicked, and it cleft. Bah! Stop. 